All right, well, why don't we get going? Hello and welcome everyone uh, to the IAM in Higher Ed Balancing Security and Ease of Use webinar. Thank you so much for joining today's session. This is our monthly webinar focused on all things identity and access management brought to you by InCommon and Internet2. My name is Jean Horsheski. I am the InCommon Academy Director and I'm your host today. Uh, so let's just get going. We're going to uh, do a little introductions, but today's presentation um, is a good one. So we are going to dive right in in just a few minutes, but uh, we will be doing some Q&A and closing. Um, so just before we get going, um, just know that we will be taking questions and comments live during our Zoom Q&A, using the Zoom Q&A function. So as you're listening today, feel free to jot down your questions. We'll be receiving them and we'll be uh, catching up with you toward the end during that segment of our presentation today. But um, feel free to also use the chat uh, so that we can have some dialogue as we're going along here. Just keep in mind that as you are chatting, make sure that the everyone in the dropdown is selected so that your comments can be seen by everyone. And many folks ask, but uh, we are of course recording this webinar. So you will receive a link to the recording via email and it will be posted on the InCommon website as well as our uh, uh, YouTube channel. So be, be watching your inbox for that. All right, well now I am happy to pass the virtual mic to our moderator, Jeremy Rosenberg, who is the Assistant Vice President for IT and CISO at Yale University. Jeremy will introduce today's speakers and today's very relevant topic. So Jeremy, please take it away. Thanks, Jean, appreciate it. Uh, great turnout, glad everybody's here. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I got my start in IT as an identity management engineer, and I remember when IAM teams um, at universities started to get moved under the information security office. For me, that was like 10 years ago now, and at the time, there was a lot of talk about identity being the new perimeter and implementing zero trust frameworks, and that's all true. But the reality is that as we get better at doing security, at patching our servers, at running next-gen firewalls, at rolling out advanced endpoint protection, it's just become easier to trick people into telling you their password than to try and actually attack our systems. And so today we're going to talk about how identity and access management has become among the most critical components of a modern information security program. We're joined today by Matt Morton, Assistant Vice President and CISO from the University of Chicago. Eric Zamatis, uh, CISO from Lehigh University, and Forrest Crowley, security architect and IAM manager, also from Lehigh University. Welcome to IAM Online, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So, uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about you and, and University of Chicago? You bet. Um, so I've been at the University of Chicago for about three years. You know, most of my career is in higher education, but it's about 20% of it in corporate and uh, so forth. I was a, a Java web architect for years. Uh, so uh, I uh, uh, understand the pain and the, and the intersections that go on with identity uh, because you have to have multiple skill sets in that space. Um, University of Chicago has got around 18 and a half thousand students, graduates and undergraduates and uh, about 11,000 employees. Uh, we've got eight uh, identity team members. Um, you know, we provide services for our health system as well as uh, for the university. Uh, we've recently moved to Okta a couple of years ago and we're in the midst of uh, uh, a massive shift in our Active Directory infrastructure, which is gonna be primarily Azure based um, and uh, also kind of up, up uplifting a uh, self-developed identity system, which I think many of us had, you know, back in the day, uh, to SailPoint. And uh, of course we use uh, Duo, like many of you do, uh, for multi-factor authentication. And and does that IAM team report into the CISO or, or do it you does. have some other Yes, it reports directly. I have a director of uh, identity management who reports to me and then uh, he's got his developers and analysts. Uh, we do have one support person because as you know, um, you know, identity and support, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, you know, they kind of go hand in hand because there's a lot of right. things that can generate friction for our users. And uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're helping them get done what they need to get done. Thanks, Matt. 
How about how about you, Eric? You want to give a quick introduction to Lehigh University? Sure. Uh, my name is Eric Zemedis, and I've uh, been in the CISO role at Lehigh for about six years. Uh, came from uh, Connecticut Higher Ed System. Uh, I tell people there's two two public systems in Connecticut. There's UConn and everything else, and I was in the everything else. Um, and um, so been in higher ed for about 30 years. Um, and at Lehigh, we, we have about 20,000 uh, faculty, staff, student accounts, et cetera. Um, we have five people on the IAM team, um, and we're, we're very heavily reliant on uh, open source tools uh, and also, you know, some some more commercial things like uh, Cisco Duo. And uh, I work, this is all managed and, and run uh, under Forrest, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Forrest for introductions. Thanks, Eric. So I'm Forrest Crowley. I'm Lehigh Security Architect and IAM Manager. Um, I've been doing something technology related for probably the majority of my life at this point, far back to when I was a kid. Um, you know, I've been at Lehigh for about nine years, give or take, with some stop-offs where I did professional penetration testing for a short while. Um, and uh, to kind of echo what Eric's saying about our uh, infrastructure, um, we are very much a, a kind of build-it shop. We love to work off of open source, kind of adopt um, technologies that we can help maintain and really customize to our liking. Uh, so we're kind of half in the uh, in common uh, TAP architecture with Midpoint, um, which we moved to from, uh, similarly to, to Matt, we kind of had a half homegrown IAM system that we we got off of uh, onto Midpoint. So a lot, of, a lot of empathy for the struggle that that can be. Excellent. Well, it sounds like we have the right people to have this conversation. So, uh, Matt, why don't you share with us some of the challenges you have at uh, University of Chicago around in this space? Sure. And I, I think what what we were mostly talking about is that, you know, in terms of like account provisioning and deprovisioning and so forth, I mean, we know about this challenges and struggles there. I'm just going to say generally, everyone has a good, you know, handle on that for the most part, right? Um, however, recently... Our challenges have been focused around the attackers, uh, threat actors, uh, basically looking to compromise accounts by working through our service desk, uh, sometimes working with the users directly, uh, you know, trying to get them to off channel, like a different email address or a non-university phone number or text number so that they can do some uh, shenanigans there to kind of get their um uh, perhaps duo codes or anything like that, right? And so um, we've got this juxtaposition between our service desk folks that want a timed resolution that's quick. We want to help our customers. We want those folks to be, you know, up and going as quickly as possible. And yet at the same time, the attackers know this. And so they create a sense of urgency to try to push, push that through and push through the service desk. Uh, the other thing is a lot of our service desk staff are tremendously uh, good people and have uh, what I would say high ceilings in terms of their ability to uh, grow and 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 move within the profession. But they're young in their career sometimes. They're early. They may be some of our least skilled or least trained at least. And, and many times CIOs have moved towards a contractor model, if you will, right, um, in, the, uh, in the help desk space. And so in other words, um, uh, it can be expensive to invest in that. And many institutions have had to, you know, make hard choices and then had to use contractors. Couple that with complex processes, and, and I'm not going to, I'm sure most everyone else's are simpler than mine, but my processes are very complex because, frankly, we're all, many of us are global organizations. You know, we have multiple constituents, constituencies not to mention multiple compliance challenges, right? And so those processes typically have multiple layers, maybe approvals, things of that nature. Um, the other thing that I would just point out too is that many of the recent ransomware attacks in the last year and a half to two years have either had a, began with a service desk call or a social engineering attempt at the service desk, or, or they had a, a coupling of that as they, as they went through that process. And again, the attackers recognize that, uh, you know, we are uh, vulnerable at that point. And so they're looking for, you know, to get accounts reset and reset in there with their credentials or their phone number, 
you know, perhaps with tokens that they control, right, from the from the multi-factor authentication, right? And then they want to escalate at some point to be a domain administrator. And um, many times when you look through the trade magazines, uh, you don't see all the, the details, right? You won't see, you know, nobody's going to talk about their incident specifically. But I, uh, you know, on the slide there, you'll see a, a link that specifically talks about uh, NTML, NTLL relay attacks on Active Directory certificate services. Now there's ways to mitigate that, um, but uh, um, Microsoft may or may not have that set to the right default setting when you set that up. So, you know, might be something you want to double check, right? And then of course the next step is then they want to deliver that ransomware payload to control your domain and everything underneath it, you know, completely, right? And then uh, extract funding or or any other things that they're, they're after there. So Eric, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, I mean, certainly we have a lot of the uh, similar type of situations. Um, you know, the like you had referenced earlier, Jeremy. You know, the uh, identity is perimeter, or it's a lot easier to. Uh, another one I like it's a lot easier to log in as you than to hack you. You know, it's just why break in a system if I can just log in as you know, pick some people from the directory and just say, hey, I'm going to imitate them. Um, so therefore. We are seeing, uh, you know, more of these fraudulent calls to the support desk. So we've had to, uh, you know, redouble our efforts to kind of be uh, connected with them. Uh, the most recent attack we had was um, at, uh, you know, twelve thirty-eight, about uh, you know, twenty-two minutes before this call started. You know, the help desk is ringing for us and I and saying, "Hey, we just, you know, it was the process where we had a callback uh, protocol." To say, hey, did you just call the help desk? Um, you know, ended up exposing it, but uh, you know, these things happen all the time. Um, you know, Forrest had the perspective kind of you know closer to the uh, to the type of thing, but what type of thing are you seeing, Forrest? Yeah, it's definitely um, there's sort of uh, an incremental step up from us improving a security uh, control to attackers finding the path of least resistance that gets them around that security control. Um, you know, most recently for us, that was getting onto phishing resistant MFA. Um, we got rid of HOTP codes, um, SMS calls, or excuse me, SMS codes and phone calls uh, for our dual security tenancy. And that is where we immediately started seeing the uptick in social engineering attacks. Um, and these attacks are, are somewhat sophisticated relative to what you might have seen maybe like four or five years ago. Um, attackers are coming armed with very detailed profiles about the folks that they're looking to impersonate. Um, in some cases, even the caller ID that uh, is shown when they call our support desk is a phone number that we have on record for that user. Um, and this is just kind of stemming from the general opening up of personal information in, in society. It's one of those kind of broad um, changes that are just affecting the way that we need to do business. So what happens? What, 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 so one of the accounts gets compromised, somebody gets tricked, the, the help desk gets, gets, uh, gets fooled. What are the impacts? Like, what do, you, what do you have to live with, Matt? Well, that's a, a great question, right? Because um, there's multiple impacts here. And you know, I want to point out a couple of things that Forrest said that need to be reiterated, right? One, I think if you saw in there, if you go back one slide, um, they talk about the broad trends about research finance being specifically targeted. Um, anybody at any institution needs to definitely pay attention to how that process works and the people that are in that office uh, specifically, because the fraudulent, you know, what the the impact is they're after money, right? Not not just sometimes ransomware; they're also looking to redirect funding, and uh, so you have to make sure that those people are protected, right? Um, the other thing that you can go ahead to the next couple slides here to the next, yeah, um, you know, is that this has created a, we, we typically have a good relationship with our service desk, right? We work well together. There's always, you know, give and take working together. It, it created an immense amount of pressure on our desk. And, and, uh, again, confirming what Forrest said, you know, when we went to do a universal prompt in March, um, the, we had seen some of this, but it really ramped up where the fraudulent phone calls started to happen because now there was literally, you know, less channels into the organization that they could use to try to do this. And um, so that's 
uh, one of the impacts. So it did create a, additional stress on the service desk. And why did why do you say that's because I mandated required Zoom verification for all password resets. So when someone would call in for a credential reset or a duo uh, reset, um, they have to get on a Zoom call and they have to show their ID with their face. Um, can that be deep faked? It sure can. Uh, and there are people who are being subject to that right now, just so you know, but usually they reserve that for CEOs or somebody that's doing large wire transfers. But at some point, this technology will be available to everybody. So that's something to keep in mind for the future, right? Um, it also, you know, increased the amount of time it takes to resolve these calls. Uh, I can think of one particular call specifically that uh, we had where because the, the, the service desk employee is working so hard to solve their problem, the person on the other end was sent, claiming to be a head of thoracic surgery and that they were in the, in the surgery, in the surgery uh, theater. And if they did not do this right and now, they were going to have them fired. And to the, to the employee's credit, um, that, that was not true. And they, they resisted and we were able to say, you know, and, and stop what could have been a pretty, pretty uh, bad attack, you know, you know, and so forth. But it, but it put a lot of pressure on that person as a person and a lot of pressure on those folks in the service desk. Same thing at, at uh, Lehigh? We've commuted definitely everybody. seen uh, lots of, uh, you know, additional stress on the, on the help desk. Uh, one of the things I try to talk to people as I go through campus and kind of bring it up is really asking people, you know, what, what do you have that, you know, where's the treasure? It's kind of a treasure hunt is how I couch it. Uh, but what do you have that, that attackers might be interested in? So do you, you know, are you responsible for transferring payments? Are you responsible for, um, you know, going into um, uh, login.gov and, and changing where ACH payments are made from the government? To, um, you know, and often people don't even think about the 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 power that they have or that the, they're they're doing these things. But when you bring it up in that point, they kind of see it. Um, so all that's you know allows us to have a more targeted view of of who we want to talk to. You know, the people in the controller's office, people in research security, people in, in the help desk, people you know that. Uh, but also uh, the people at the registrar's office, people in HR that answer phone calls. Um, all those things are kind of important to kind of build that community so that everyone kind of understands how we're being attacked across the university and, uh, you know, allow us to kind of um, respond. Forrest, do you have other things? Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, we, you know, tried to get rid of all of the non-phishing resistant factors that we were allowing in our duo tenancy. And, you know, that's really where the friction kind of started to pick up for us um, initially, um, you know, there's, a, for me, a bit of an equity concern um, around like what factors are allowed for folks to use and what methods we're using to verify identities. Uh, just because, say, you have a population of professor emeritus that are frequently using uh, institutional accounts, they may not have uh, or may not prefer to use a smartphone that can install an app. How are we going to allow them to, to get through multi-factor? In the same kind of vein, uh, document verification, when we're starting to talk about ID call, or excuse me, uh, checking IDs over like a Zoom call, uh, folks may not readily have an ID available that is something that our support desk folks are uh, comfortable interpreting, right? Uh, particularly international students. Um, for example, uh, somebody who's coming in with a passport from a foreign country, some folks might not be comfortable reading that and making a determination. Uh, and all of that can really build up and cause this friction that just increases the amount of time and effort required to support folks. So, um, so, so some, I know we're getting a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm going to take a minute and sort of, we'll talk about some of them. I know a bunch of, some of these questions you do answer, but there's an interesting question here about uh, whether or not you're doing anything different with your high risk environments. I don't know if either of you have, have, have medical schools or, or healthcare operations that, that may require, you know, different tactics. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to some of that. So we also have secure data enclaves as well, right? For for secure research data. So there's multiple layers of of, of this. Um, for those folks, you know, I think it was in one of the earlier slides. You know, we talked about you know looking at those high impact individuals 
and you know shoring up controls. One of the things that uh, we've not we're not fully implemented on, but we have the capacity to, is uh, Duo's um, posture checking, you know, which is included in the universal prompt. So we did go all in in that, and the idea there is is right is that that gives you more of an enhanced verification of the device and the person that's using the device and who's in control of it. Uh, as well as giving us some visibility into what they're doing there. Um, uh, but in terms of like things like PHI and things of that nature, we, we provide uh, some of the identity infrastructure for our health system. And so as a result of that, we have to be cautious, right? Because there's this balance between life safety and patient care and also ensuring Uh, you know, that we're making things secure. And so when we had some, uh, we'll call them issues uh, around the start of the year, and uh, as we were noticing, those same issues were happening in the health system. And so we kind of worked together to align how our service desks were operating. Because what could happen was, is they call into one service desk and they hit a brick wall with a Zoom ID verification. And if the other desk isn't doing it, then they've then they've got a path in, right? And so, and and the reason that that infrastructure is that way is because we have clinicians who are also researchers who are also faculty, right? And so they cross those boundaries, and uh, because of that complexity, it becomes very difficult to defend that. Do you, do you guys have any special cases at Lehigh? Everyone's so. <laughs> <laughs> So Lehigh does have a, you know, we're building some secure research enclaves, uh, kind of an expectation that that kind of like really sensitive research data is going to be entering our environment eventually. Um, part of our strategy has kind of been to understand our identity management um, infrastructure as like a single centralized unit. And when we have a user that's in that kind of uh, highly secure uh, enclave, the security requirements from that kind of bleed out into the rest of their identity at the institution. So it's not just enough that like in the context of the security enclave, they're treated with a higher level of scrutiny. Also, like if they're calling for that kind of standard, like help I reset my password type support. Yeah. So, you know, once you put your toe in the pond, you're going you're to be completely in the pond uh, for, for your other things too, which is going to, you know, create some additional friction, but we're also looking at, you know, one of the things I'm trying to uh, design is more of a executive protection type of thing, because I mean, the provost and the president, they're, they're specifically targeted all the time. So, uh, you know, what, and, and these, some of these individuals work, you know, tremendous amount of hours. So they're constantly bleeding their personal life and their, uh, um, and their, their work life together. So, it, because it's very convenient, but then I often caution them is that, you know, your target because of your association with Lehigh, and you don't want that to be, to bring in that into your personal life. So we're trying to come up with that population too, to kind of specifically protect them. So And, and do they listen to you when you try and communicate this? Well, I mean, you know, when you're, you know, going 110 percent it's it's tough to kind of uh, so yes they do listen they're they're concerned they they'd like to have um you know additional you know i'm really looking for more solutions so i kind of throw that question out a lot of times uh you know what are people doing to protect executives um uh, but one of the things certainly is that they kind of enhanced you know using the the duo uh um uh, uh what's it called now that with the extra id verified push verified yeah, push, verified push. Um, yeah, you know, things like that that would be pretty low friction, but provide some additional uh, uh, pieces for them. So, so, so we're we're tossing around a bunch of different ways of doing MFA, and uh, and of course MFA was supposed to be the solution to all of this, and uh, and look at where we are now. Um, and so, you know, we've heard you say that you've disabled SMS and and uh, and phone calls. There are folks in the chat who are incredulous at the suggestion that you could actually get away with turning off SMS. Um, we also have a question about, you know, what about people who refuse to put Duo on their phone? If if they can't do a phone call and they can't do SMS uh, and they won't install it on their own uh, iPhone, are you giving out YubiKeys? So, uh, you know, could, you want to, um, <laughs> there's a YubiKey right there. <laughs> Forrest, Forrest, do you want to speak to the challenges of, of, of getting out of some of these lower uh, fidelity um, uh, MFA 
types and and how you deal with these folks who don't want to touch who don't want you to mess with their phone yeah uh that's definitely something uh probably the most common complaint we get um around getting you know getting into duo and using mfa is i don't want to put this on my phone um in which case our response is we're going with the security key then um additionally there are particularly with duo security and, and web authn in general it doesn't necessarily have to be a uv key um Android phones are perfectly happy acting as a factor um, for a user's account uh, in Duo. So you can set up uh, an Android phone or I think an iPhone as well to touch ID, do the biometrics, and that's what counts as the web auth then. Um, there's a little bit of uh, software support, hardware support kind of dynamic going on with that, where sometimes folks' devices will work with it, sometimes they won't. That is an option that, uh, that some people do end up uh, getting into. I, I would say the biggest issue that we've had with it was uh, around um, the user interface that Duo Security specifically has. Um, when you disable those factors, like phone call and SMS, there really isn't a reason for there to be a like verified phone number attached to the user, but Duo still solicits it. And the way that Duo is architected, you can get yourself into a state where it thinks you've enrolled, but you haven't. That's probably generated the largest number of really troublesome, long-lived uh, support desk calls that we've had to, to deal with. Um, and finally, um, just as far as you know, allowing other factors, uh, I did want to mention also Touch ID on, on MacBooks and Windows Hello um, on Windows are also options. The problem that they tend to have is that they only work on that device. If users understand that they do tend to be pretty accepting of it and all right with it, but it also tends to be a, a point where they can get themselves into trouble and need to reach out for help. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges with the whole all password lists and all this other things is just the user doesn't understand the password concept's been around so long that they just natively understand that. And the second factor is like, oh, that's just an add on to my password. And now we're new models are just kind of like confusing them that have, you know, leaves them locked out sometimes when they when they need access. Um, I would just add too that as far as overcoming that barrier, um, you know, my contract per se with the university is that we're going to have a value base, like set a minimum standard of what we can do for security and to try to interfere with you as little as possible to try to cost the university as little as possible. But when we have breakthrough things, when things change, that we're going to react quick. And so uh, I find executives kind of understand that, but users understand too, well, why are you doing this? Well, people are getting their paychecks stolen. Oh, I don't want my paycheck stolen. Well, yeah, okay. And it does, doesn't get everybody on board, but it does that whole like sense that we're only making changes when the changes are needed rather than because it's, you know, I, I think it's best or something. There's actual events occurring behind that. So that's a, uh, so that's a great point about, you know, finding the right level uh, to, to to manage security in a place as, as wild as a research university or any university for that matter. Um, so we have a good question here, like what kind of governance structure works in higher ed to, to get these stakeholders? Who, who do you talk to? How do you get buy-in to turn off SMS? You know, Matt, what, what do you do? Well, um, I think somebody mentioned the uh, pitchforks and, and so forth and, and uh, you know, things above you want to avoid that honestly some of it has to come from courage and you have to do that you have to have top level support and uh, so i work kind of in at both ends of the equation if you will so i will work with leadership to ensure they're on board but also let them know that uh, you know this is going to need to go through faculty governance uh, because faculty are typically the most vocal uh, when it comes to these kinds of changes um, and um, uh, so working through them, making sure they understand it. We have a faculty committee specifically set up for this. And that group, um, you know, will ask very hard questions. I mean, they're super smart people. They're there. It's great to have those things answered ahead of time. But as long as I have their endorsement, then I can go further. Sometimes I might need to go to faculty senate, um, you know, SMS or uh, phone calls. Probably won't have to do that. Uh, but for big policy changes or anything related to like 
you know, you're going to be touching my device with something that could be monitoring me, et cetera. Those kinds of things definitely require uh, a faculty conversation. That makes it harder, right? Because it takes longer. But as, as exemplified in the uh, what happened in for us in February, sometimes you just have to just cut bait, right? You, you just have to just do it and move to it. And uh, then I have to just, you know, figure I'm going to answer or not, right? And so it, it can be difficult, but uh, but you just have to have courage. And what about Lehigh? Do you have, what kind of formal governance structure do you have, if any, to deal with this? Well, we have uh, um, a faculty representation, a number of, uh, uh, there's a security specific committee, a compliance security committee. Uh, there's also a, a general IT guidance committee that has faculty representation. Um, so typically we will work with, with those folks first. They don't always do the best job of communicating out, but at least we're, we're engaging as part of the process for those folks. Uh, when we did make the change away from SMS and uh, uh, phone calls, we did, you know, there was a whole communication strategy around it. It did not happen overnight. Uh, we we announced it. Then we would email people who who didn't have secure factors registered every week, um, and that list dwindled down. Uh, so there was a pretty aggressive communication strategy. So people did have objections, and some people did. Uh, that's where I'd have those individual conversations with them, but say, here, this is the reason we're doing it because it's the old way. It's not working anymore. It's you're not your account's right. not your your account might be. You know, a lot of times we have people use their Lehigh account for their. TIA re to retirement and said, think about all the money you have in retirement. Do you want someone else getting in there? They're like, oh, no, that's a bad idea. Let's 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 get this going quicker. You know, <laughs> how do I move over faster? Uh, so so kind of finding what, you know, engaging and speaking their language. I think the biggest audience that objects to our changes now is going to be the help desk, right? Because we're putting that load on them. It's like, you know, now, you know, I think 30 percent of our calls are are identity related, um, password resets, MFA problems, uh, can't log into this, you know, it's just uh, the more friction we put on there, the more uh, difficult it gets for them. So, yeah, to, to well, echo, well, let's go ahead first. I was going to say, to echo what Eric's saying about communication strategies, um, you know, one of the things we did when we were really making that push for uh, tightening up multi-factor was uh, we had like a short kind of webinar series where we sat down with folks who were concerned and talked to them about it. And like, not only that, but like got into breakout rooms and helped them directly with the trouble that they might've been having setting it up for themselves. It, it kind of hits a little bit different when it's not just like, oh, you know, Eric is sending me this email that I'm gonna have to do this thing. And Eric is sitting on Zoom with me right now, helping me set it up. I think there's a lot of value in that. Great. We just had to miss lunches twice a week for a couple of months. <laughs> so we're, we're getting a bunch of questions uh, about possible solutions to some of these problems. So why don't we move on to the to the next uh, couple of slides where, um, where, where, where we talk a bit about what you've learned and what you're trying to do about it. Matt, you want to yeah, lead yeah. us? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we, we should be clear that we don't have the magic silver bullet per se, right? But uh, but there's some things that are definitely can happen. I mean, in terms of like me requiring the Zoom and uh, and an ID for re recertifications, that's a that's a short term solution. The longer term solution, right, is to look at verification products. Like things I think somebody mentioned ID.me in the in the chat, and uh, uh, there's a myriad of these if you can imagine. Now there are varying degrees of uh, price. So I would caution, you know, beware buyer on that uh, because you will get back some pretty big numbers uh, on these things. Um, but we need to get to that, right? We need to work at, you know, what is the minimum level of verification needed to be able to feel confident about what we're doing and also, you know, reduce the friction for the user so that they can, you know, so that they can handle this themselves and for the desk, right? Um, one of the other things that we look at doing is, you know, also adding alerts, any other things that we can do to trigger off of these recertification events so that if something does happen that we didn't expect or want to have happen, we can react quickly, right? Uh, being able to uh, respond quickly uh, in these situations really can be the difference maker uh, between having a minor incident and something that's huge. And uh, so that's that's one of the areas uh, that we're working on. But I, I'm I'm really putting a lot of my, uh, I guess, 
eggs in the basket of looking for a good recertification, uh, excuse me, a verification tool, a proofing tool. Um, what there is not is a good open source solution around this that I have run into. You know, if anybody has that, that uh, uh, concept or anything that's, you know, even in its initial stages, I'd love to hear more about it. But uh, um, the, the vendors are well aware of this because we're not the only ones being attacked like this. A lot of corporate America is as well. And, uh, uh, but, you know, we have specific needs around our budgets and how we're supporting the institution. Uh, so when you're mission driven, we have a little different focus. So, so we have a question here. Um, can you, can you describe how one or more of these verification products you're describing actually work? I don't know how, have you done an, enough research into it to be able to describe how it would work if you were using it? I'll just do a brief thing. And then I don't know if Eric or Forrest, if you guys have looked into this at all, but uh, essentially what it is, is it's asking you, there's, there's the rudimentary stuff like from, I think it's Equifax or somebody that'll, you know, did you live at this address seven years ago? You know, those kinds of questions, you know, I, I'm looking for the video uh, recertification stuff. And, you know, some of them even do things where like you submit a photograph, right? With you and you know, like a selfie with you and whatever. Um, yeah, and Microsoft's got a tool out that has come out as well that I think bears looking into because it's integrated. I'm sure you have to move to A5 to get to that, but that's another 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 issue. Um, but uh, you know, essentially, it's it's a way to put into your recertification process a step that takes them off to somebody that can actually do a video quickly, and then there's some automation that occurs to verify that within a certain degree of reliability, right? Can it be defeated? I'm sure we'll be talking in a year about how those are being defeated, but uh, uh, we've got to have uh, something to both take that load off the desk and then make sure that uh, we're reproofing appropriately. We also need to narrow what that group is too. Right now, I'm probably got casting a wide net. Um, we probably can, with uh, the alerts that I was talking about and so forth, and those triggers, you know, only certain things might require that kind of level of, re, you know, identity proofing, right? And so to kind of narrow that, I don't know, Eric or Forrest, you got any thoughts on that? Forrest has been running a uh, kind of starting a, a trial or a demo of a particular products. Do you want to describe how that works for us? Yeah, so uh, we've, we've been in touch with a couple of vendors. At the moment, we've kind of picked out one that has a bit of an interesting take. Um, I don't want to name names or anything, uh, keep, keep the webinar neutral, but they are almost more of like a customer identity management product that happens to have a pretty robust identity verification uh, component. And their system was flexible enough that we are doing like this pilot where we uh, essentially send... Um, our users through their like uh, authentication flow, where one of the steps is to do a document verification. So like their idea of is it is uh, you're a business and you need to check someone's ID before you can sell them something. Um, but it was flexible enough for us to use for just plain, hey, somebody's calling us and we need to verify their identity, but um, we want to send them off to the automated system, right? Um, so they have a whole workflow, uh, a separate vendor that they rely on to do the actual proofing event that they abstract away from uh, us so that we just need to give them enough information to be able to check the ID. And then the user can pick up their phone, go through their process, their workflow, um, take a picture of their ID along with themselves in frame, and then that will spit out a yes or no. Were they validated? Were they not validated? Um, and for us, what we find particularly appealing is the this particular vendor supports, I think they said something like 200 different government, uh, different countries' government IDs. Um, and one of the big challenges we had was that that piece where our support desk wasn't really comfortable addressing um, an ID from a country outside the US. That's a good point. You, you forget that we're big, we have big international populations in our schools. Oh, yeah. So I think, and there's a, uh you know, scenarios where we might send people who had some kind of event that says, hey, maybe their identity has been compromised, where we do that recertification that Matt talked about. Uh, but also if they call the help desk and the help desk needs to do that verification, they'd be able to, you know, ideally yeah. kick it off and say, here, here, I'll send you a link. You need to you need to do this process and that then we'll be able to, you know, get you squared away, that type of thing. So it's particularly useful for 
you know, higher education in general right now, because it's not just, uh, you know, account compromises or identity ver verification for credential changes. Um, you know, there are compliance pressures that want universities to be more confident about the identity of the person behind an account. Um, NIH and uh, the National Science Foundation uh, are, are both still kind of in process adopting standards for um, universities to assert that identity um, and how, how it was scrutinized. So there, there is also some level of like, we have to do something like this in the future, we might as well find a general solution. So uh, I'm just looking at the slides. I, I think, Forrest, you, you got to a lot of the items on your slide about insights. Is there anything else you wanted to mention from this from this slide? Because I know the next one is about advice, and I'm pretty sure everybody wants to hear about that. Oh, yeah. I think I'm good. I think we touched on pretty much everything here. All right. So let's move to that recommendation slide and, and talk a bit about what people could be doing. So. Who wants to go first? But what's the magic answer? Come on, we're all here for the silver bullet that you said it doesn't exist. Well, I think you know the first bullet is really about um, you know the identity verification has to be kind of a university wide thing. Um, so you know if if they go and gather a bunch of private information from HR and then go over to the help desk or they start the help desk and go to HR, you know, so we're seeing this this pivoting where they're just fishing and, and grabbing information and so. We need to make sure that you know our registrar's office, our um, you know, HR, and other key areas, research, uh, all have anyone who kind of support, interacts with the public in that way through a non uh, in person or even in person, right? Uh, we you know we might not be requiring ID in certain offices, you know, where we always need to assert identity. Uh, we need to come up with solutions that are going to work across the campus. So that's one of the things that that I think is we have in progress and it's something we can do a lot better, but um, it's kind of on our strategic roadmap. There's also an aspect to that of, um, even if your institution is not in a position where you can sit down and say, okay, we're gonna require ID verification for password resets and MFA resets, um, having the processes laid out, having the standards set is gonna be very helpful when you have that like brick through the window moment where suddenly you do have to do this. Um, and even if it takes a long time for that to happen, it gives your help desk folks a backup plan in case they do end up in a situation where other security controls are preventing somebody from getting something done and they aren't comfortable with the, the situation. It gives them that, like, I can ultimately ask for an ID and I don't have to sit here and say, no, I can't help you. You know, then a couple of other things, you know, in addition to that great stuff, um, you know, be ready to change or enhance your technology strategy, right? And so I think the ID verification tools come into play there. I mean, um, I'm not going to say our, our proofing was perfect, right? But it was adequate for what we needed it for. But as we saw, the attackers changed. So now our proofing may or may not be what we need, right? And so so we have to be able to pivot and uh, and move quickly. And I, the other thing that has uh, come up for me recently is uh, as we have re-looked at the technology and the processes and the people that are uh, integrated uh, with identity, right? Because that is where it all comes together. Um, when we do a review of that, we find things. We find processes that may be broken or not being followed. We find technology that's... Uh, like duct tape, perhaps, right, between two systems, uh, you know, um, and so forth. And things that you wouldn't expect would be there, but they are there. And, and the only other thing I would add, too, is, you know, I, I'm sure many of us have Active Directory and LDAP infrastructures and uh, um, review that like crazy. Uh, continual review of that is probably one of the key areas that, because uh, this is where your, your other clients, right, the units, the departments, uh, <clears throat> computer science department, maybe, um, are getting that information, right? Are getting and how they interact with the identity system. And uh, if that's not secure, that's another another issue. And you know, it's not on the slide, but one thing to kind of do for areas, I mean, we all, we, we could make a list of the type of attacks we're going to see, uh, 
direct deposit scams, uh, accounts payable scams, uh, attempts to do research on things we talked about today, but ransomware and other on and on and on. Um, but the things that are identity related, if you have like SMS and you can't get away from it, I mean, you can tell your executives up front, like we're going to have an event that's going to involve someone around this table or someone how high profile is going to damage the institution. And then we're going to get rid of the SMS. Right. And they're going to be like, yeah, I guess so. Uh, do you want to get rid of it now or that? Do you want to wait? They'll be like, huh, that's yeah. But anyway, we can, we can, even if we're not ready to make changes, just having that list of things that we know are going to occur because it's occurring at other higher institutions, um, you know, helps us kind of prepare for, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to prepare for this and how are we going to be ready? So, yeah, there's always going to be, even at a more granular level, when you're talking about like a specific security control that you might be designing, there's always going to be little exceptions, little compromises that you have to make in order to build something that you feel is going to be appropriate for your environment, your institution. But you also have to be prepared for each one of those details. Um, you may have an attacker who indeed compromises that, who uses, who abuses that uh, exception to to do something really nasty. And you really want to be prepared ahead of time to patch that um, and deal with the consequences of, of correcting that. Um, making sure that you have the path forward for the folks who were using that exception before that exception even becomes uh, problematic. Great insight. So we're, we're getting close to the last 10 minutes here, and I want to make sure that anybody who has questions um, gets a chance to ask them. So um, please do put some questions in the Q&A section. Um, I got a couple of questions that I'm curious about. Um, one, and you've kind of talked about this a, a, a bit, but, you know, I've always thought it was the thing that always, uh, how do I put it? Well, how do you combat the help desk's predisposition to be helpful? I mean, it's in their name. And, you know, and, and the attackers know that, like, what are you saying to the help desk? How are you changing that culture? Well, um, you know, perhaps the threat of not being employed there anymore, it could be one way, uh, but I prefer a softer approach, right? Because um, folks, folks are doing the best that they can and they, you're right, they want to help. That's what their whole purpose is. That's where the documentation and the guardrails, the things that you have in place around your process really come in to help guide them appropriately. It's, you know, you're not gonna hit everything, but you have to really work on that. I would say the other thing is, is we began meeting uh, every two weeks, have a check-in with the service desk people. And that, that check-in has done immense things to help grow both the relationships, but also, you know, I, honestly, if somebody's at the service desk and they have a question, I don't mind them contacting me. You know, that I would rather them do that if they're concerned than to make a executive decision, so to speak, and uh, cause some sort of compromise that we didn't want. Yeah, are you pen testing them? Sorry, Eric. I'm just curious if you're are you pen testing the help desk? We did this last go around. Yes. Sorry, Eric. Go ahead. We, we have not. I mean, I, I just to echo what Matt said. You know. Um, you know, the help desk, like he had alluded to earlier, so often some of the people who are more entry level, less experienced, uh, and just telling them that they're important and, you know, spending the time with them like you're doing the help desk, uh, you know, maybe, you know, bringing a pizza for them once in a while or answering their questions or all things that says, hey, you know, what you do is valued and, and, uh, and, uh, and we really, you know, you're part of that protection layer for the university. And, and they usually like that feeling of just being valued and uh, so simple. Sometimes those simple things are, are the most effective. Yeah. And it's a, you know, here's a tip. They can be an on-ramp into your security organization too, right? And uh, I can't tell you how many people I've pulled in that way. So. Yeah, our, our Lehigh is very blessed. Our help desk folks, uh, you know, the, some of our very experienced ones have really, really good gut checks on stuff. Um, many, many times these kinds of social engineering attacks weren't even necessarily caught by like a procedure. It was their experience saying to them, something doesn't feel right. We need to talk to Eric or Forrest. Yeah, that's a great point. Inter interesting question in the chat is, do you expect everybody on the help desk to be able to do verification or is it it's somebody's job? Is there the verification person? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one because we we're still wrestling with that. I'll be honest. Um, one of the thoughts was is that like when Forrest says, you know, if they 
their spider senses go off and they think something's up and they maybe don't feel like they're qualified. They do escalate to tier one or tier, or excuse me, tier two or tier three support, which is the identity team, quite frankly. Um, however, we have things that we're doing in the identity team too, like development and system setup and all this other stuff that makes it difficult to balance that. And uh, I would, uh, you know, that may be an interim solution, but I, I'm really hoping to rely on some of this uh, verification technology to help. help with that but our help desk director has uh created a new process where if they need to reset the you know the password and um um and their two-factor or something wrong with two-factor they they use two people so they'll just split you know separation of duties type of thing rather than uh mm. that just saying only certain people can do it because that that's a scheduling nightmare for them I and mean, that's their biggest challenge is scheduling yeah agreed particularly if you're a contractor or something like that, but having a procedure that maybe uh, requires a delay, a, uh, you know, a second person to be involved you know, to approve it, that type of thing. Was that was that their idea that yeah. that helped us? Yeah, that's interesting. So you're, you're um, I, I mean, I don't know why I ever thought of that, but you're you're actually part creating a partnership with the help desk to actually help solve these problems together. That's great. We have someone in a role uh, who's new. It's a new role and a new person for Lehigh, but uh, uh, she works on forest team uh, um, identity access management analysts. So they're responsible for a lot of documentation and that type of thing, and they they participate in the uh, the department meetings at, as almost like a help desk. They've shadowed the help desk, they, you know, to, to create that that bond, that bridge. Like we're on the same team, and and she brings stuff back to um, the rest of the IAM team and security team around. You know, these are these are the pain points that they're having and that type of. Thing. Yeah, even before that, we had a uh, one of the members of our identity management team uh, was. Kind of shared with our support desk 50 50 uh, half their time was on the desk half their time was with us um and that that relationship is really really useful even just to have someone who's working a shift that's from the identity team at the same time as you are that you can just run things by or escalate things to directly uh, and really smooth over some some bumps that you run into you have someone on call for uh, some kind of specialist on call 24 7 from your iam teams yeah, Forrest and I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah agree. That's about the same. Yeah, because there was a question about whether any of us have a a a, t a team, an account management team that's like dedicated to taking these escalations, but that seems like a, a luxury in higher ed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would say more like the analyst approach that uh, Eric is talking about, because then that analyst can document that, and we can you know put that in some sort of uh, governance process within the system right so that we don't have to always uh handhold in that way but if we we have talked about some kind of formal on-call process simply so we just so everyone doesn't feel on call all the time um you know as a you know because we're all that the team just naturally you know chips in wherever it's needed that's kind of our whole approach across it um but when it's so frequent it just starts to wear you down so we are looking at stuff. So I'm noticing that we uh, have gotten through 55 minutes and we have not yet done our legally mandated discussion about the impact of AI on all of this. Oh, you had to bring it up, Jeremy. <laughs> We're going to let you get away without at least telling us how AI is both the uh, cause and solution to all your problems. But seriously, do you have any reason to believe that AI is, is, uh, aiding in the in, in these attacks that 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 they are becoming more successful because the bad guys have access to this technology so i will um answer with what i know and then maybe if eric and forrest have other you know thoughts on this but uh so personally uh at our service desk to our knowledge we have not seen um what, what i would call any ai aided uh social engineering attacks with that said I'm a member of a CISO group uh, in the Chicagoland area, and uh, I can count off at least several Fortune 500 companies and a couple of Fortune 1000 that have documented evidence of both audio and video AI uh, attacks that were uh, involved in usually wire transfers. And so like it would start with like the CEO saying, hey, I need to get on a Zoom call. 
and we're going to get on this call and we're going to get this wire transferred and wherever set up that I just, I just negotiated or something like that. And people do it. And then they got on the call and they noticed things were a little janky. Right. And so then that's where the flags went off. So I fully expect to, there to be that going on if it's not going on for us right now. Yeah, the scenario we we talked about is if we're largely relying on Zoom, like some kind of ID, we're showing an ID. Yeah, it wouldn't be crazy for AI just to put up a, a Pennsylvania ID over this card, right? Yep. This is this is me. Yeah, well, it, yep. it matches. It looks like a real ID. It's everything. You know, let's yep. it. Um, so that isn't even a full video. It's just you know some random person with a blank card that looks like it's an ID. Haven't seen it, but that's you know certainly foreseeable. Cool. Well, I don't know. I think we're pretty much out of time. Uh, I don't know, Gene. Do you do I pass it back to you? Do you want to have some closing comments? I just want to thank you guys immensely for this. I learned a ton. I kept meaning to write something down, but then I remembered we're being <laughs> recorded. So, very special thanks to Jennifer and the Internet Two team for helping us make this all happen. And uh, we hope to see you in January. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.